work with goes cultural collection. Uh, I really do believe that uh, when I start going through the stories, start talking about uh, when you go through Haida Harbors and Argelite, uh, 85 to 90 percent of the stories all come out of the Tunzen. When you take a look at all their history and all the doubt that they share on there, all their stories are related to the to the Tunzen. So uh, this was the epicenter for a lot of cultural projects that went out um, from the mixing of all the different nations. Uh, from my understanding, anybody that some of you get, they refer to them as Alu you get the first ones forward, those born of, born of high status, and people who do things out in the open. Algogas, the noble or big man who possesses the ability, capacity to represent or to give advice. Now it's all, uh, all of this is back up and laid out in, uh, in the Gixen, uh, well, Kiyinsk. We say Kugelsiansk in our language, but they lay out all of, all of this stuff. So a lot of uh, my references, I use the uh, Gixen and just turn it into our dialect. Gulgit, that's our word for, uh, for feasting. Potlatch is a uh, is, uh, Chinook term. Chinook language is a simplified uh, language that was used for trade and commerce from the Clinkets all the way down to the Salish. Will to Will, Feast of Black, after the name passed on from the ancestor, the name is considered as being held. Wolf Mus, usually a year later, the name is now being worn, being put on him. Now the regalia has been passed on. Oif is to Khan, the name being strengthened. Yao is a final feast for a smogget. Now it becomes the name. And accepting and committing to the responsibility to become the next living embodiment of the ancestral name. So when I went to a workshop with uh, Smog at High Mass, uh, Chester Work, he laid out a lot of stuff for me. He uh, said, Sim Hoist Kum Gat is the long form term for Smog. And he, he uh, gave a workshop and he laid it out quite well, but I'm just going to simplify here and we'll get into that. A well-respected, knowledgeable, culturally educated individual to represent and speak for the nation and the tribe. Uh, Smogit in the old dialect, uh, Sim is real, Ogit is real and declared a person. Um, some of you get a plural for many. As you go through the feasting system, a lot of us have forgotten and we don't use a lot of these, uh, a lot of these titles anymore. Uh, and Smogit. Small in status, not necessarily a short person, but small in status. They're just beginning, they're feasting, they're learning. Uh, Smogin Mwap is uh, for the host group. Smogin Kalsap is for the village. Kami Smogit is, uh, is the one that's... I'll give you an instance of that. Uh, my cousin, uh, Eric Gray, he's in the Kinaf Namik. They use Smogit Liam Lakhat as a Kami Smogit. Because uh, Smogit Waxi Bax has not, has not been in place for a long time. So uh, Smogit Liam serves as the Rakami Smogit. He's in place of. Historically, um, when they came to a village, if the Smogit wasn't there, they always had somebody appointed to welcome and do the protocol and welcome in because he was of uh, equal knowledge. To Smogit is um, the literal translation is harder or fast, but somebody who was uh, very good technically uh, for war. So there was somebody that they could depend on when, when it came time to war. There was a whole group of them that were, were put into that status. Um, significantly, uh, High Master's group, uh, what is the name of the group again? High Master's group. What's the group? Yeah. They, were, they would have been considered as a group that were considered to use some of it. And the same with the uh, Kipo Sabah. Uh, we smug it as uh, large in status, they've feasted, they've elevated their name, they've elevated the tribes. This whole thing is based on capacity and um, the ability to serve nation, tribes, clans, and host groups to uplift everybody. So when he feasted a certain amount of time, then he became we smug it because he's elevated himself up to it's, it's acknowledged. Uh, smog is kind of falling out of place because we don't really use these anymore. Uh, so it'd be Kaskugum Smog at Nishaganat, he'd be the head of um, all of the of first place amongst the uh, Kitsis. Man Smog is a uh, status level at uh, upper or foremost. He's uh, um, 
smug it for the whole nation. And in my books there, I started to, um, uh, as I'm reading, as I'm researching, as I'm going through the adult, they talk about these terms, some of them. And so now, I'm, I'm, as I'm learning, I'm adding these terms to who, who were the two smug it? Who, who were smoking web, smoking both sides? So now I'm adding, adding to the photographs as well. Jet briefly touched into the, the female leadership side, and there's an equal amount of uh, status levels on the female side. It's just that I don't have a grasp of the of language, of the spelling, and enough to understand to, to uh, translate and transcribe a lot of it. I, you should see my original list and my original notes are pretty damn confusing to me at the time when I first started out. <laughs> No, I had to, okay. uh, I see these titles. What the heck do they mean? Because sometimes I'd ask an elder, Albert Brooks, for one. He translated it for me. Lu Sitar. He said, they're the ones that sit off to the side in the big house when they have meetings. They don't have a voice. They sit to the side and he says they have to keep quiet. They're listening, they're learning. The elders and the, the some of you get them to get a knock as they're speaking. They're taking in all that information like you guys are now, and they're learning their place in the in the society. So again, Tim Zhen, Yao, Nista Ayuk, Pixan Ayuk, ancestral matriarchal laws. It's based on it. It's something that uh, we pushed aside now. Most of us are um, uh, most of us throughout the nation. We've uh, learned how to, how to stand up the patriarchy without really acknowledging or fully representing the Sigurdman up in our nations anymore. There's information available. There's a, I'll, I'll share that with you as you go along here. There's a lady that's uh, from uh, Lopes Hygienics. She's wrote, uh, she's done her, she's got her PhD doctorate. She's Gixan and she's done a lot of work on nation rebuilding. And she did the uh, roles, rules, duties of women in governance amongst the Kwakwakiwak. And um, I imagine that a lot of that will be transferable to the Big Sun this time in Jin at some point in time here. Chinook dialect um, originates out of uh, the tribe, they call that. And they used its uh, jargon language, a hybrid language simplified in vocabulary and grammar to communicate with other developed, with others developed for trade and commerce throughout the Northwest Coast, like I said, from Pinkett all the way down to the Salish. Both of my grandfathers uh, spoke a bit of the language. We were talking to each other one day and I asked them, what the heck is that? They said, it doesn't sound like Somali to me. They said, well, so they're using the language that they used to speak here a long time ago, but it's fallen out of place now. They said, uh, hardly anybody knows it, so we decided to use what few words we know now. Teach is uh, prairie trees, we have four of them. Chep, literal translation, what under my understanding, he makes himself crest. Total of 842 crests uh, gives you uh, gives you the timeline for when these were all developed. Uh, Google Kiansk, for all time distribution to be handed down through the generations. We've skipped 150 years of that now, so we haven't yeah. really pieced the property. Potlatch ban was in place until 1952. Um, do have journals uh, that talk about um, Robert Sankey. His daughter had journals when they feasted, she said, uh, when their house burnt down. Feasting wasn't allowed then. So they went there, uh, two people at a time, they brought their gifts, they kept uh, uh, a record of it. People come in and contribute, they feed them, put money, nails, wood, whatever, to rebuild their house. So that was a form of feasting. And when, her, when your dad feasted, they put up a flagpole. 1946, it was still illegal. They still could have got arrested for it. They still could have gone to jail for it. Uh, 1946 was the end of the Second World War. Um, they were taking the Nazis to the World Court then, and people were starting to look around and realize, ooh, boy, uh, we better kind of step lightly here. We better not go in. And, uh, so at that point in time, um, kids were still being taken. There was RCMP gunboats that used to come, come to the village. Uh, Bobby Sankey related to me one time. He said he woke up when he, he said he was six years old then. He said only him and, um, and um, Arnold Brooks were the only kids in the village. He said they 
came in and emptied out the whole village. Kids five years old enough. And they, um, after the war, after the um, Native Brotherhood formed, they started fighting more for our rights. So we came, uh, when my dad was young, he used to come to this town here. He said they weren't allowed in the shopping centers. They weren't allowed in most of the restaurants. He said only when the Chinese came and worked here, they bought up the restaurants and invited them in. But I was wondering why the Native people loved the Chinese food so much. <laughs> so, history. He said, uh, my dad said they were wooden floor blocks here when he was a kid. They had Model T Forge here with six horsepower motors in them. He said they used to have to get out as kids and push the taxis up the hills around here because uh, they couldn't go very fast. Mm. So 1910 was the formation of the city that they named after uh, Prince Rupert of the Rhine. They signed a deal with, uh, with the Metal Catholic Land Council. Apparently, uh, Harold Layton's great great grandfather was the one that signed it. So, all of the stuff, all of it was illegal. And they just carried it on because nobody has said anything, nobody's challenged them, nobody's uh, done anything about it up to this point in time. Anyways, uh, up to this point in time, uh, there's been very few lawyers that have stepped forward and they've kept, kept it quiet. Uh, the whole legal system, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, when they make declarations, they call it, they say it about themselves as being an arm of the federal government. And uh, a guy named Bruce MacGyver, he studied a lot of our, a lot of our um, social structures, said all they're doing is they're denying the existence of our hereditary structure. And that's all they've done since contact. So all they're saying is, no, they don't exist. No, we'll just keep going forward. We've got our administrative process. We've got all these cities in place. Uh, Canada produces as, as uh, gross as $2.2 trillion a year. 92% of the jurisdiction and all the decisions are made through the Department of Indian Affairs. They've broken them up into two sections now. So we don't have any, um, for instance, uh, I don't know exactly the numbers at the Super Port. Quite a few years ago, we Most talked about this. Product. Let's join the nations together. Let's just charge them 2%. The only reason we need that is we want to start feasting again, we want to start putting our history together. We want to start um, having a pot of money for the tribes to access again. So we developed the capacity to uh, to stand our structure up again. So what they've done, what they've done up to now, the federal government, provincial government, and all these corporations that have formed over here, they go right to the bank councils, and the bank council says that uh, I heard this at the last meeting. They said uh, the federal government, the provincial government, they only recognize us, the bank council. They don't recognize the register system. So again, it just they put blinders on, so it's up to us to we've got to get our law or laws down on paper. Our Google Tents, our constitution has to be based on all our tribal projects, all of this stuff that I'm talking about here. This is who we are, these are our timelines, these are our DNA tables, this is part of the Doug Moo case that says who we are. We're, we're only recognized by our neighbors, by, our, by the tribal groups that are around us, not by the de facto um, government that exists out there. It exists in reality, but it's illegal in international legal terms. Okay, Google Tents for all time distribution passed on to the following generations. Those are hereditary names, crests, the Dow, they all fall underneath that. Smuggled Quiscane, William Bain collected approximately 380 Dow. And each one have broken some of them down into all the four clans. Just the water now, I've got 120 Dow for the Gispid water. 1,200 collected pages of documents for them. Like I said, uh, after 12 years, I kind of gave up collecting all this stuff. So now, I want to share it. I want to give it out to whoever wants, wants to have it. Uh, they figure out we need to have a central location here to do all our genealogy, a place to